Okay, hey Adam, how are you? Um, I'm okay. Great, so we are, uh, let's recap the year that was, uh, and the Oscar race in particular. Um, this was a year that at the start of the year, I didn't know what to expect. I was assuming that this could be a very, um, year, a, a year deprived of a lot of great stuff because I was just assuming a lot of things would be moved forward in the calendar. Um, and to my surprise, I think there were just a lot of, uh, films that were independent or films that were below the radar that I saw that I really enjoyed. And I saw about 45 films this year, and a much smaller percentage of those were sequels, tentpoles, reboots, blockbusters. Um, the only things I really saw that were, um, I saw Sonic the Hedgehog, I saw Birds of Prey. One of the only reboots I saw was Rebecca, which was a remake of a, 19, of a Hitchcock film. That was the, one of the least intellectual properties one of the least intellectual intellectual properties I saw, or the, one of the least original uh, uh, movies I saw. And that means that it was a pretty good year for that. What about yeah, you? With, yeah, with me, I saw Birds of Prey and then the, the Wonder Woman sequel. Uh, you're right, this, because of COVID and theaters shutting down, a lot of the big franchise films were postponed. Such as uh, Black Yeah, and it it had the effect of I think if people were watching stuff that was not IPs, people were watching a lot, a lot, a lot more of their filmmaking, but a lot of their film watching budget was not IPs, which I think was a pretty good thing. Yes, I mean I I wasn't happy about all the theaters closed, not being able to go, but certainly the silver lining is that it made me gave a little bit more attention to films that, that could use it. Uh, you know, a film like Sound of Metal or One Night Miami, one of those, or Minari, one of those types of films. I think One Night in Miami would have always been a big product because uh, the award season is bending over backwards to try to reward black films to avoid press, which we'll talk about in a minute. I think there's stuff that's even below the level of One Night in Miami in, in terms of, like, like I'm thinking of, like, Uncle Frank, Blow the Man Down, Kajillionaire. Uh, there was a film by Miranda Julie that you liked a lot. Actually, I didn't, I didn't catch Kajillionaire, but I liked it. That's on my list. What was the Miranda Julie film you saw? Well, many years ago I saw uh, Me and You and Everyone You Know. You mean the one this year she released? No, that was, that was a few years ago. Oh, I just thought it was on your top ten list. It was a Miranda Julie. No, no, no. There, there's a different film. You may have been thinking of uh, Never Rarely Sometimes. Yes, yes. So, like, that's the kind of film that would be well below the radar on most years. But, like, it might, it, it, it might trend on Amazon or Prime or Netflix or Hulu, which, you know, people are definitely consuming right now in the pandemic so that's a good trend um and as we saw the oscars as a result picked films that were not really um would never have really gotten too much of a wide release like the sound of metal or like you said minari or uh, maybe the father maybe that would have gotten it i think anthony hopkins probably would have been a big enough draw and the father actually did play in the Beatles. um it's one of the few that, that uh, Oscar contenders that did. I was assuming a lot of them played in theaters in L.A. because one of my uh, podcasts is with uh, Jody Berman, who I guess you'll see on this cha channel. She says that she's in L.A. where, yeah, there's restricted seating, but nearly everything that was up for Oscars did play in L.A. Well, I'm glad it did in L.A. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's and New York was a totally different story. Um... So, what did you think, so, yeah, so what did you think of the, um, I guess what they came up with, or what did you think of, yeah, I guess there were, there were eight, I wish there were nine, but what did you think of the eight and the, some of the choices? I thought, I thought the eight they picked were, were solid, I thought Mank was maybe a little overrated, but even that I enjoyed, you know, part because of my film history, but... But the ones that were there, I, you know, I, I all appreciated. And, you know, I think 
some of them, like you know, Madland or uh, Sound of Metal or Minari, were, were really terrific. So I think, it, in general, the Academy did a decent job with, uh, with, with its selections, especially given the circumstances. <laughs> they didn't do as good a job with the actual ceremony, but I guess we'll get to that later. Uh, yeah, I agree. They did what they could with the circumstances they could. I think the main problem with the ceremony was not showing clips, because you are showing below-the-radar films, and I have never seen a clip of Minari. I never saw a preview of it. I went to the theater five times the last year. There were, there were, we're, we're, we're being exposed to less movie trailers, because we're not going to the theater as much, so we're not seeing... I'm not going to, like, go out of my way to, like, go to YouTube and be like, show me a trailer of, you know, all the films that are under the radar. So, as a result, I've never seen a mi I've never seen a second of footage of that film. So, uh, they could have definitely showed some footage of stuff. <laughs> yes. So, someone, someone you hadn't seen one of the films, they won't really get a good reason why they should. Yeah. From the absurd. They also have, uh, I mean, I think that every year they try to mix things up. I mean, I appreciated Steven Soderbergh trying to be Ocean's Eleven-ish with the fonts and the walk-up. I appreciated, uh, I think that it was really good to give a, like, a bio, a, a, a background to people in each industry. Like, I was like, okay, what is, why would someone want to be a sound person or a costume person or a, you know, and that was really good. Um, as for the picks... Um, yeah, so, but, um, well, what were your quabbles with the ceremony? Let's do that before we get to the pigs. Well, number one, there, there really wasn't much humor in it, especially, I think, given what everyone's gone through. I think the Oscars could have had a little, not that it should be a nonstop joke fest, but it could have had a little bit more humor, maybe not taking itself quite as seriously. The... The other problem, which has been well documented, but for a good reason, is is messing up the order of the award. Some of them it's fine to a degree, but there's a reason why Best Picture goes last. It's because that's the best film total. And also, there's always someone from the film, uh, from the Best Picture winner, to accept the award. You're not going to get a situation as what happened, where the last award of the night, no one was there to accept it. They took a chance that Chadwick Boseman would get the award and that his wife would give a, a moving speech, which I'm sure she would have. I, I thought he was going to win, but he didn't. I would have picked Boseman, but Hopkins was terrific too, and I have no problem with him winning. But the, the way that they set it up, really spotlighted the fact that it wasn't Bozeman, it was Hopkins, and that Hopkins wasn't there. And that's not doing anyone any favors. I think that, I, yeah, I agree. It was, um, and they also were very, uh, my understanding is they were not receptive to Anthony Hopkins' camp. Did you hear about that? That he said that he wanted to, like, stay up or whatever. But and you're forcing an 83 year old man to stay up to like six or something in the more I don't know to be up to be odd at some odd hour in Wales, um, so that was also kind of odd. I think I'm not sure specifically what was going on there. Um, I also yeah I don't know what did you hear about the Anthony Hopkins situation or why he was why he wasn't allowed to give a speech on the spot. Pretty similar because the academy as a rule said we're not doing Zoom we're not doing remote hookups. They looked at some of the other um, award ceremonies, and there were technical problems, and they thought it took away from spontaneity, and that sounds fine in theory. But yes, if you're an 83-year-old man, you're not going to necessarily want to hop on a flight to L.A. or even go to the hub and stay up to, you know, 3 in the morning, your time. Were some people in a theater in in London? Was that where it was? Cause there were, or, or Paris? Because there were some... But there were even some a, Danish people accepting the awards. That was a compromise that, well, you can come to the hub. So Hopkins could have gone to London, but again, he's 83 years old, and it's, 
you know, his time probably would have been, you know, very early in the morning, 3 or 4 a.m., and, you know, if I, if I were one of his, if I were on his team or one of his relatives, I wouldn't want him doing that. Yeah, and you mentioned there was a lack of humor. I think the, well, I'm, I guess I'm going to get into is that I was, I, as I shared with you, I was thinking of not watching the Oscars. I ended up watching it because for about eight or nine years, I've known that my mom is a really good person to watch award ceremonies with them. I, her, I sometimes see the Golden Globes with her. And I was thinking, it's been a year since I watched the Oscars with my mom, and I just thought, this year we should really watch it together. And um, I, I don't know, I didn't want to let her down, but I was thinking of boycotting. And one of the main reasons is I felt that they... They need a host. I mean, to me, one of the great... It's exciting every year someone new, like, whatever, uh, you know, Regina King or Rami Malek can say, this person's an Oscar winner. We have one new Oscar winner to add to the fold. And one year we could have said, we now have Kevin Hart as an Oscar host on the heels of Neil Patrick Harris and Jimmy Kimmel and, you know, whatever. Uh, And we didn't get that opportunity and we're not, we're, they're too afraid to even put anyone as host. And I think that they could have just made Regina King or the person who goes first and say they're the official host. And for me, I don't know, I just felt like it's an opportunity to award some comic. You could go with, there's so many great choices, you know. You can go with Tom Hanks, you can go with Tiffany Haddish, you can go with Kumail Nanjiani. The list is endless of great people and it's unfortunate that they're, they've basically been like, no, we just don't want to, we're afraid to put a host because maybe someone will dig in their past and they'll get cancelled I think is what it is yeah um, I mean it was ridiculous what happened with Kevin Hart a couple of years ago it was a, a lot of fuss over over virtually nothing uh, I, I agree you know the host is someone who kind of guides the audience kind of shows them you know hey this is fun you know we'll, we'll make it we'll make a joke here and there to just kind of lighten the mood. I could understand doing it a couple of years, you know, trying something new, but I think at this point, they really should go back to a host next year, and I think they would. I, I would be surprised if they didn't, um, in, in an effort to try to, to get ratings again. I mean, maybe go back to Kevin Hart. I, I would have loved to have seen Eddie Murphy host it. He was going to a few years ago and dropped out because of problems with Ratner, and I still hope that he'll, he'll host the Oscars one of these days. I'd just love to see what he can do with it. Yeah, and I, well, it's interesting is Eddie Murphy had a, had, had an, 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 there was negative press on Eddie Murphy around the time of Dreamgirls, saying that he was difficult on sets, and there was, a, there was negative press on him at the Oscars that night, saying that he stormed off after Alan Arkin beat him, and people who... Uh, were on the scene and said he didn't storm off, he just politely excused himself and he, you know, left because he just, you know, probably had other things to do that night and he wasn't, he wasn't throwing a hissy fit, he never said a mean word about Alan Arkin the whole time. So, I mean, to some degree, I think Eddie Murphy might be getting a bad rap, I don't know. But, um, m- moving on, because we have to watch the time, um, well, I, I, I was thinking of boycotting the awards this year because I think that at a certain point the Oscars are um, influenced and they're kowtowing to a, uh, say, a public interest group that is demanding that the Oscars be diverse and judging them very negatively if they don't have any black nominees. For three years in a row, they averaged about five or somewhere between five and six, five point something uh, nominees, people of color as acting nominees outside of the 20, then when they had an off year where they only had two, um, the, they had to deal with media headlines, and then the, uh, the media headlines saying they weren't, well, let me finish my sentence and then you can respond, they had to deal with media headlines saying that they were racist, blah, blah, and that, they have to put up with that just kind of inaccurate news, so that means that they will have to make decisions to kowtow to that media, and at some point, the ceremony is entirely compromised. I don't know, do they have to have a minimum of eight nominees, ten nominees, six nominees to satisfy the media? 
at some point, um, it's it's out of hand. Well, if you can point to a nominee who doesn't deserve it, and where you can make a case while they're only there because they're trying to meet the quota, then I might agree with you. But I don't, I didn't see any films like that. Um, I thought, you know, the the one best picture nominee with an African American focus, Judas and the Black Messiah, that was a terrific film. I think it, it, it would certainly deserve to be there. Um, yeah, you don't want to have quotas or anything. At the same time, you know, you look at the Academy traditionally does not have a good record at honoring uh, films that with uh, films made by African Americans or films made by women. And it's not checking a box. It's having a, more, a fuller recognition of the, the excellence of the film world has to offer. So, you know, just as an example, you know, one of the uh, results of the Oscars So White campaign from a few years ago, the Academy diversified its membership, uh, not just in terms of, of minority, but also having people from other countries. And so you saw last year Parasite, which I thought was terrific, you know, a foreign, foreign language film that never won before. Uh, Parasite was a great film. Everything in Hollywood 
is meeting our requirements of diversity. Our PR problem is solved. Now stop complaining. Stop test. Stop putting every film up to a woke litmus test. That's what I'm suggesting. Your turn at the best, sir. Yeah, I don't think every film is up to. I mean, I'll, I'll agree. There are certainly problems in Hollywood with it being too PC at times. But I think when you had, you know, years where you had zero minority acting nominees in this day and age, that 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 it was a problem because what you were getting wasn't a representative sample of the best of the film world had to offer. And I think we're getting, I think we're getting better. I can't, I can't really speak to the BAFTAs. I'm not that familiar with their rules. But I'm glad that the Academy, you know, uh, the Academy here is diversifying their membership. For many years, their membership was uh, very white and very old. A lot of them hadn't even been working in films for a while. And there's nothing wrong with older white people voting, but it should not, you know, you, you should have a much more representative cross-section of